Linda Mearns from the National Center of Atmospheric Research. We're, this is going to be this is a, a series, a lecture, a series on regional climate change that we're we're holding through uh, well this semester and perhaps beyond. Uh, Linda is director of the Weather and Climate Impact Assessment Science Program. Her credentials keep going. So she's also the head of the Regional Integrated Science Collective within the Institute of Mathematics and Applied to Genetic Sciences. Senior Science at the National Center, I already said that. Uh, he's uh, been an author in the IPCC reports from, did you do the latest one? Oh, you bet you my god. Yeah, so, so all of them. That was all of them. Basically, all of them. Not the first one, not my kid. American. Starting in 95, yeah, I was 95, I don't think I was born. Assessment. <laughs> <laughs> climate variability. Uh, that's her interest, is in climate variability on a regional scale, and today's talk will be on the credibility of this sort of thing, uh, model predictions for the future. Thank you, thank you for being so patient. Certainly. I hope everybody is planning to stay an extra 15 minutes for my words of wisdom. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy to be here. I've... Um, already had a great morning and lunch chatting with people. Um, every interaction has been uh, enjoyable and education and can one ask for more? I don't think so. Um, all right, so I've done a lot of work with regional models and just regional climate change projections also from global models. And this issue of the credibility of climate model projections, particularly on uh, the regional scale has gotten a lot of attention, but there are many, many challenges. So this is going to be sort of a, a sort of medium big view of this problem. And by the way, I realize this is a mixed audience. I like mixed audiences, but it's hard to know what people know. But I know that I don't know what you know, and so it's not an unknown unknown, which is good. Um, so if I say anything or use an acronym or whatever that you don't understand, uh, please stop me because I'd much rather that you understand. Okay? So um, credibility is, of course, related to uncertainty. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Voltaire about that. Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is an absurd one. And I certainly think <laughs> this is true about regional climate change. There will always be uncertainty in it. Um, and the other half of that is, and that's okay, because in point of fact, we all know how to make decisions under uncertainty. So basically, what a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is how can we best evaluate the quality of climate models and establish their credibility. And I think on the next slide, hopefully I have something about, all right. So partially this relates to what's the purpose? What are you going to use these climate projections for? Um, and I've divided the possible reasons for establishing reliability or credibility to these three sort of bins. One is for recommending um, what scenarios should be used for impacts assessments, research in impacts. But more and more commonly now, there's more pressure for, to produce scenarios of future climate change for actual decision making. A water resource manager, for example, in Denver. Um, and one of the interesting points is, well, is the standard of credibility different if you're just doing impacts research versus if you're actually spending money, for example, to actually start developing infrastructure in an adaptation plan but in the implementation of a plan? Um, another one, of course, that I'm very familiar with is selecting which global models should be used to drive regional climate models. And how many of you were here for Ray Arrett's talk last week? OK, so you guys are pretty familiar with the whole idea of nesting a regional model inside a GCM. And by saying that, anybody who wasn't at that talk, you've kind of got the basics right there. And then another important task is for differential weighting of different models to provide better measures of uncertainty. And this has to do with the, the model democracy problem. Like, is e does each model, global climate model, get a vote in, let's say, an ensemble of climate model simulations. So I'm going to be discussing this in terms of multimodel ensembles, both global and regional climate models. And needless to say, these multimodel ensembles do not cover all the possible uncertainty. But it's a, 
it's a common way of looking at a certain type of uncertainty. So what do we mean by this? Um, for a long time, oh, here's a question. How many of you were alive in 1989? Maybe I should say the other way. Who was not alive in 1989? One, two, three. OK. So I asked this because the next slide I'm going to show has to do with 1989. And so for the longest time, it's kind of climate modelers, analysts would make statements that if the model reproduced observations well, whatever that means, which really means whatever the reviewers of the article would tolerate, then we would have confidence in future projection. But my argument is that just doing better in terms of biases is really not adequate for any of the purposes I indicated earlier. OK, so here is our slide from 1989, Joel Smith et al. This was from the EPA report on climate change in the US. And this is back when most of the model experiments were done as just two times CO2 experiments. And so these just give the comparisons. Oh, yes, this, I should probably use this. Good, it works. Um, so here's three different models, the GIST, the GFDL, and what was then known as the OSU model. And so for the lower 48, uh, for the four seasons, you have changes in temperature and changes in precip millimeters per day. And of course, one of the things that was very disturbing to people then was, oh my god, we have an opposite direction of change. And what do we do about that? And what does that mean? What's interesting, 89, 99, 2009, so 25 years later, at least, we really still do not know how to manage this problem to the degree that it is a problem, um, although there have been some improvements. The other thing about the two times CO2 experiments, there was this strange rule about this, that if your biases were smaller than the two times CO2 climate change, then you were OK. If it was larger, then you weren't OK. And when you think about that, that's an incredibly arbitrary metric for having confidence in a result. Uh, but that's actually, and I participated in articles in which we made that claim. OK, so here we are now with uh, the sort of newer simulations. This is a change in summer precip. These are from the CMIP-3 models. CMIP-3 models, that's the group of models that were used in the last assessment report global climate models. And this is just a snapshot of you know, two very different responses from the GFDL. This is change in seasonal average precip from the mid-century, mid-21st century back to the end of the 20th, um, or the beginning of, no, the end of the 20th. Yes, we're in the 21st, right. And so that's the result from GFDL for summer precip. And here's the result from CCSM. And note, you know, just very large differences in some of these areas. And again, what does that mean? Does it mean we don't have confidence in either of these models, both of those models, and so forth? So relationship to uncertainty. Now, this has to do with the model democracy. So historically, and generally in most of the recent IPCC reports, although I'm going to show you an example where this isn't the case, each climate model is given equal weight in summarizing the model results. So each model, how many of you are familiar with the um, what is it, RCPs, the newer scenarios of concentrations? Nodding, OK. So um, for the last report, it was the SRES emission scenarios. This time around, it's the RCPs. In many ways, from the point of view of climate response, it doesn't make that much of a big difference except for the aerosols. Um, in either case, the point is, does each model provide the same level of useful information about the future? Or should some models be downweighted because they're really crummy in some aspect or another? And this has been you know, an ongoing battle. And there's been just a plethora of articles about how to weight these models. One of the problems is we have a relatively large Earth with different regions. So does it matter if you do a good job on the South Asian monsoon, but a poor job on the Southwest North American monsoon? Does that matter? 
In other words, what are the teleconnections? Should you be able to do all monsoons well to be able to um, have a weight if you're concerned with changes in monsoon areas? Um, so as I said, there have been rapid uh, developments in how to differentiate your weight climate model simulations, particularly in probabilistic models of uncertainty of regional climate change. And I'll show you some examples of that. So uh, the first one, actually, that um, Filippo and I, Filippo Giorgi, um, and I did in 2002, 2003, was what we call the REA method. Not a very REA, it's not a very attractive acronym, but there we are. Um, so this provided summary measures of regional climate change based on weighted average of the climate model responses. And the weights were based on the model reliability. Weights based on model reliability. It does not say the same thing. Hmm. Um, I don't understand what I was saying there. Let's skip that line. Um, there were two different criteria. One was, of course, the performance of the AOGCM, some kind of evaluation. And the other was model convergence, which ended up being a very, um, let's say, an issue that people had a lot of opinions on. That convergence, well, why should convergence in and of itself indicate greater reliability? What was interesting about that was that that's what, when I gave this presentation or other people did, Filippo, they would say, well, convergence is not a good criterion. And yet, if you actually talk to these scientists, when they were just looking at models, similarity in responses clearly, intuitively mattered to them, but not when it was pointed out as a bald scientific principle, which is very interesting in terms of, I guess, philosophy of science. All right, I'm, I'm not going to go in this, into this in detail. This is a result. These are different regions that uh, Filippo had earlier divided the world into. Uh, this is the natural variability. These are essentially, here's the REA method, and here's just the straight average. And you'll find that in some areas, yeah, there's maybe, you know, a degree difference, and the REA result is usually higher. Um, and then in other areas, they're really, you know, pretty much identical. So I think in this paper, you know, what we say that yeah, the REA changes differ from simple averaging, from a few tenths to 1K for temperature, a few tenths to 10% of precipitation. And an important thing we pointed to, the uncertainty range is narrower in the REA method. Does that mean that we succeeded in reducing the uncertainty? Kind of, if you buy what we did with the method. Um, and the important thing, the lesson here in terms of the model reliability, um, the performance versus the convergence, was that to improve further, you had to really reduce model biases if you buy into this method. So that was actually the first attempt, I think, at weighting models. Now, here's an example from the work of Claudia Tabaldi and Reto Knuti, a summary article that they did about different means of producing primarily Bayesian uh, probabilistic models. And these are, again, for different regions. This is for the A1B uh, SRES scenario. And I'll just point out a couple of them. There are three different methods, the Tabaldi et al., Green et al., and Kure et al., and these are the raw GCMs, again, for the CMET3 set. And you'll see in some situations, why, there's quite a difference in these three. In other situations, like Western North America in summer, there, there are some differences, but they're pretty convergent. One of the big differences, all three of these methods use some kind of weighting. The big difference is that Green et al., the weighting was done on how well the model reproduced trends, which is much more difficult for the models to do than to reproduce um, you know, mean climate for these particular areas. And I would submit that for the NSEP, for the CMIP3 models that getting trends right is too tough a test for them. I don't quite have time to go into why, but um, I think that's one of the reasons why Führer and Tavaldi are reasonably close and Green et al. tend to be shifted, um, not always in the same direction. It depends upon the area. 
So the point is, I'm making a point that, yeah, waiting, depending on what you're waiting with, can make a big difference in terms of probabilistic methods, uh, estimates of regional climate change. So there's been a lot of searching for the correct performance metrics for climate models. Um, and as it estimates, as, uh, attempts to rank them, and it's so much of it depends upon the variable considered, and it points to the difficulty of using one grand performance index. For example, the Hadley Modeling Center came up with this overarching index that included a lot of sub-indices in it and tried to make that the metric, which quite frankly did not work very well. Um, and my point is the importance of evaluating a, evaluating a broad spectrum of climate processes and phenomena. And a very nice paper by Peter Gleckler and colleagues in JGR back in 2008. We're really pretty much in the same situation now. It remains largely unknown what aspects of observed climate must be simulated well to make reliable predictions about future climate. Now I'm going to provide you some examples where people came up with sometimes simple metrics, sometimes other. One by John Walsh and colleagues, again back in 2008, and he just you know, was looking at model performance over Alaska and Greenland. Again, this is with the CMIP-3 models. And he just came up with the root mean square errors of seasonal cycles of temperature, precip, and sea level pressure. And they did find a relationship. One of the things is to see, is there a relationship between the model errors and the future climate. So there is a tendency that they found with, of models with small errors to simulate larger greenhouse gas warming over the Arctic and greater increases in precip. Um, and that selecting models, you know, based on this metric um, may narrow uncertainty and obtain more robust estimates of future climate change in the Arctic. So John Walsh determined that from his point of view, compared to just averaging all these models, that the change for Alaska and Greenland should actually be, just change in annual temperature, should actually be larger based on the application of these metrics. Another study by, good job, I knew that was going to happen, by um, Francina Dominguez and colleagues at Arizona. You can imagine they're very interested in scenarios for the Southwest. They work with various stakeholders. And um, they looked at the evaluation of the SEMA-3 models for winter temperature and precip, and they used in a modified version of Georgian Mearns, and also the reproduction of the 250 millibar geopotential height field to reflect the location of the subtropical jet stream. And to cut to the conclusion, they found that two models, the ECM-5 and the hadsey m 3 scored best for consideration of these three variables. And why were they doing this? Because they were developing scenarios of climate change, and they were also going to be nesting um, the WARF model in these GCMs. So here's just a little bit more of a detail about this. This is the area they were looking at. This, I know you can't possibly read that scale, but I think you can just see this is the observations, and this is, these are the model precipitation, the annual cycle. And of course, everybody does a lot better on temperature. These are the models uh, that you also can't possibly read, but that's okay. So uh, most of the models really don't do so great on the seasonal cycle of precipitation in the Southwest. So then they, they combine sort of their modified REA, these are the different models, um, and then the circulation scores based on the 250 millibar height. And they concluded that indeed when they combined the scores that those two models that I indicated above were the best models to use. And so that's what they did. Now, is that right? Is that wrong? That's not clear. What they have done, however, is they come up with a method, they've come up with criterion, and they judged the models by those criteria. So from the point of view of producing a publishable piece of work, 
they've done that in kind of a lawyerly way. And I'm not disagreeing with them. I think these, um, you know, I'm not sure about the REA scores in some ways, but sure, I'll give them the circulation scores. And they also went on and found that they did better in the reproduction of ENSO. Um, but none of the models at that point were doing terribly well. Okay, now we're going to zip forward to evaluation of Arctic sea ice in the current IPCC. So these are results from the um, IPCC Working Group 1 Chapter 9, that is the evaluation chapter. And this shows, so these are all the newer CMIP-5 models. And this is the ice, Arctic sea ice extent. The heavy red line indicates the mean for the CMIP-5 models. And the um, blue represents the mean for the CMIP-3. And then um, these are the observations from um, a satellite-based platform. So over here, it's kind of the same thing. It's just simplifying things so you can see them more clearly. And this is like you consider you know, an interval of the, uh, the 95 to 5 percentiles for all the models. And what you'll see very distinctly, all right, at the time when the observations were a little less certain, Neither of them do well. The CMIP-5 really overestimates the sea ice tremendously. CMIP-3, sorry. The CMIP-5 does much better. And the CMIP-5, from the point when the observations become more reliable, tracks them pretty well, especially that downturning. And you don't see that downturning in the CMIP-5 models. So this, and this is really great progress. Because if you look at the last report, they're really, um, the models did, well, as you can see, much more poorly. And so there was this sense, OK, the sea ice decreases, but at what rate? Because at what rate is very important, um, if nothing else, because of shipping. And we have countries now sort of fighting over who owns um, different parts of the Arctic Ocean, which is an interesting, of all the actions people have to take, the fact that they're willing to fight over the Arctic is a little disappointing compared to actually trying to do something about climate change. But that's a, a side comment that I will, of course, have removed from the video. <laughs> so what does it say about some very important large messages from the IPCC reports that the nearly ice-free Arctic Ocean before mid-century is likely, and those words mean very specific things in the IPCC lexicon under RCP 8.5. And you can think of RCP 8.5 as being sort of business as usual. In other words, that's kind of the direction we're heading. Um, however, they did something which I think is pretty unprecedented for the IPCC. For those of you who have not been involved in many of these reports, you may not be struck by this, but I was struck by this. They actually came up with a subset of subset of those models that I showed you in the early slide um, that most closely reproduce several factors of climatological mean, state, and trend. And they came up with only five models that they consider to be uh, sufficiently robust in terms of reproducing these factors. And here's an example where the model selection is used, which is really unusual for the IPCC. Um, and interestingly enough, I didn't realize this, but for example, the NCAR model is not one of them. Oh. oh. Sorry, does the, when you say climatological mean, does that include the seasonal cycle? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, the trend, the seasonal, uh, there's actually more to it that you can look at. I think this is also from chapter f 9 and chapter f 14, I think. And so here's an example where the model solution is used, uh, but it's based on a series of diagnostics that they think really relates to processes related to the biases. And in this case, the biases in the current climate really affect the future changes. And when you have that situation, then you really need to pay more attention to those biases. Um, is that it? All right, so here are the five. I won't name them. Um, this is actually chapter 12 from Working Group 2. And so here are the five. This is the background of, I'm pretty sure these are the CMIP-5. These are probably the CMIP-3 models. 
And here is where you get um, these models that are seen as performing better, producing, getting down to what's considered negligible sea ice extent, many of them before 2050, most of them. And so this ended up being a big message in the IPCC, the possibility of really having ice-free Arctic before 2050. So I would say this is an example where weighting and selecting, you can still argue, well, isn't there another model that was pretty good? You know, wh what are the cutoffs? But I think this is a good example where selecting, related to weighting, um, has been pretty functional. And I kudos to the IPCC to uh, not feeling that they always have to include all the models, which quite frankly I suspect is also um, partially for political reasons because the IPCC is the an international organization and made up of nation states and they all have investments in their own climate models, including of course the NCAR model. Okay, so here's another example that's really getting into processes and this is now, this was from Hall and Chu in 2006. This has been a very well-traveled result showing that the snow albedo feedback in some ways a relatively simple phenomenon um, is very, that the seasonal cycle of that albedo feedback is very strongly correlated with the climate change. And from their analyses of this, they think really the same processes are obtained both in the seasonal cycle. And by the seasonal cycle, what they mean is um, they just take the difference in the albedo, April versus March, and the difference in the temperature change, April versus March, I mean not temperature change, just seasonal cycle. And that becomes um, this ro ratio of percentage change per Kelvin. And then on the um, other axis is the same axis nicely, uh, the climate change. And so they really related this, that the snow albedo feedback strength in the seasonal cycle context are highly correlated with that in the climate change context. And they demonstrate that that really um, had a lot to do with the processes. Here's just another slide of the same thing showing from a uh, remotely sensed platform where they think the actual seasonal cycle relationship is. And this is for the northern hemisphere. Uh, and notice these are CMIP3 models. Not many of them really fall in there. They get the relationship right, but not many of them are really within that sweet spot of the observations. However, we move forward to CMIP5. Sorry, this is a little blurry. And now you'll see, number one, same relationship. The colored uh, squares are the CMIP5 models. And you see that more of them fall within the observations. And this is, again, considered progress. And I think it is. And I think this, having this kind of relationship is really very useful. Uh, in being able to diagnose what models you may trust, um, particularly from the climate change point of view. Okay, now, so I showed you some nice process-oriented studies where selection mattered, but that's always not the case. So for example, uh, Pierce et al. looked at future average temperature over the western U.S., 14 randomly selected GCMs, again from the CMA3, produce results indistinguishable from those produced by subset of best models, okay? And if you get no relationship, well then, in what sense are you, are the selecting the best models giving you uh, better information? Um, Reto Knuti and colleagues looked at a metric of precipitation trend, again, 11 random selected GCMs, and produced the same results as those from 11 best GCMs. And so clearly, it very much depends upon what the context, both the variable, the process, and the region, as to whether or not selection uh, gets you anywhere. Okay, now I'm going to turn to regional models. And this is strongly, you know, it's the same idea, really, selecting, weighting them, it's still models that are developing, that are reproducing processes of the climate system. But this is particularly related to the issue of added value. Everyone talks about What's the added value of your regional model simulation? Why is it worth putting in all this human time and the gazillions of um, 
all the computer resources to generate all this extra detail if you don't know if that information is really adding to one's understanding of climate change. So the IPCC, this is very interesting to me, the IPCC definition, and I think they kind of, well, let's say I don't think it's a very interesting definition. Something can be true without being interesting, but in this case I don't think it's really a useful definition. That added value in downscaling is the measure of the extent to which the downscaled climate is closer to observations than the model from which the boundary conditions were obtained. Okay, fine. Then quoting myself in a chapter about downscaling over North America, I really prefer to think of it as that you're really producing additional knowledge about the climate, the current and future gained from applying an RCM. And from my point of view, yes, you expect, you hope, say over complex topography, that my goodness, if the regional model doesn't validate better, that's pretty pathetic. But I think that's not sufficient. I think it's necessary but not sufficient. And really much more work has to be done on a process level. Because for one thing, all of these models have errors. And they're going to have errors forever. So understanding what the errors do on a process level is very important. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an example. This Ensembles is a project um, over Europe that was done a few years ago in which they ran a bunch of different RCMs driven by a bunch of different GCMs at um, 25 kilometers. And they came up with different metrics. And this was based on the ERA 40, that's a reanalysis product that were driving these models. And they had a large scale circulation weather regimes based, I believe, on the 250 millibar heights. Um, actually, different, a series of EOFs of those, I believe. Um, a mesoscale signal. And the, the names next to these were the institutions that produced those for this whole European project. Um, three, PDS of daily precip and temperature. Temperature and precip extremes. Of course, extremes are more and more important temperature trends, and temperature and precip annual cycle. So they calculated all these. There's a special issue of climate research dedicated to this, 2010. But ultimately, and some of them on an individual basis um, were somewhat useful. But what they did was they particularly thought, OK, they believed it was important to hit on all of these. So they basically took the product of all six of those so that if you fell down on one, you would essentially um, have a low score. That's an interesting assumption. Is that, do we all believe that you have to get all of them at a high value to be valuable? Um, and here is the result. 15 different RCMs driven by ERA 40. And these are different means of combining the different metrics. Um, so the product is the, the purple one, and it's kind of amazing that um, that is the weight going up to, they're, they're all set up so that they have to add up to one. I mean, for each model, not, um, yeah, I think that's it. So I'm not quite sure why. They do have to add up to one. I can't really tell you then exactly. This should be related, certainly, to the, um, the weighting score. Um, the point is, model seven, the tall poppy, did better than everybody by a lot. And so what's interesting, if you read this article by Jens Christensen, it's interesting how they discuss this result, because they kind of downplay the fact that according to their criteria, this model is far and away the best model. So then the question is, well, should you just use that one? No, because there's still a belief that these other models contribute, just not as much as this. And I'll, we're not going to go through all this, but that model is the KNMI RACMO2. Um, and the blue numbers are the highest values for 
these different metrics. And you can see that it does best, not only overall, but for a number of the individual metrics, and uh, certainly never at the bottom. And um, so this was very interesting that they actually you know, published this, because there's tremendous sensitivity in the climate modeling community about bashing other people's models. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, again, I think sort of a sociology of science issue. Well, if your model is bad, shouldn't you just admit it and move on? But it's very interesting. If you look at Christian's at all models, they never say that you should just use that model. Fine, they can say that the other models contribute something. But it's really downplayed in this slightly um, weird way. So you might want to check that out. Oh, I also want to point out this Uranus model, because it's going to come up uh, in something else, which does, let's see, let's see, it doesn't do too badly on F1 is the large scale circulation. I can't remember what F3, but it does the poorest on the um, third metric. And so anyway, so they took all of this, cranked them all together. Decay and Samo particularly looked at, produced PDFs of climate and climate change uh, for European capitals. And so here's a temperature PDF for climate change for Lisbon. Um, so I assume they did this by taking grid boxes in the vicinity of Lisbon. Remember, the grid size is about 25 kilometers. And essentially, the, the um, solid one is the current climate. The future is the climate, I believe, in the mid-21st century. And you do see shifts. And there's something wrong with this. I don't know how I screwed this up. The point is that these lines behind it the heavier lines are weighted according to those finely aggregate scores. And the lines behind them are, you can think of it as being unweighted. And really, the bottom line of Decay and Samo was that, you know, the weighting didn't matter in the PDFs, which was really interesting. Because you'll find that there are now a lot of articles like this. And the point is, well, what happens when you combine, you know, so many different metrics? especially when you restrict the values they can have. And we're working on a couple of cases that pretty much demonstrate that with this kind of system, it's almost impossible to get a strong um, effect. What happened? I'm moving through my own slides. Hmm. Hello. OK. So now I'm going to provide some examples from this program that I directed. It still exists, but the simulations have finished. It's in the North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program. And we were looking at multiple uncertainties in regional and global climate models using four different global climate models, the CMIP-3 variety, and six different regional models. And these are now, this was at a 50 kilometer resolution, about 30 miles. And we produced this also for um, producing climate scenarios for the impacts and adaptation assessments, and also to establish the credibility. And there are many participants, many funding agencies. And there's the domain at 50 kilometers showing the topography. So um, I'm going to be discussing several different things from this, starting off with you always, with a regional climate model project, you always do simulations using some kind of reanalysis. And reanalysis is a product that combines both a forecasting model and then assimilates observations. So it's considered to be the best boundary conditions you're going to get. Okay? And so we had 25 years of that. And one of the set of results I'll show you is just related to that. Then we did climate change simulations with the A2 SRES scenario, um, four GCMs against six RCMs. And then we also did some time slice experiments with just um, atmospheric models. And I'll skip the rest of that. OK, so um, Melissa Bukowski, a project scientist working in my group, we thought, OK, well, you know, these very smart European guys, 
also in the mid-latitudes. They thought these six metrics would be useful. Might be worth doing this for a different domain. So we kind of reproduced those. And we found something very interesting that, uh, so here are the six different GCMs. This is that Canadian GCM again that was labeled Uranos on the other slide. And here's the UK Met Office um, regional model wharf that many of you have worked with. Um, and these show the metrics with and without the large scale forcing parameter, that first metric. Um, and the CRCM, when you include that metric, becomes by far the most dominant model in terms of producing well. And it doesn't have that much of a, an effect. It actually makes some of them certainly um, worse. As a matter of fact, a lot of them. Practically all of them. Yeah, I didn't really notice that before. So the point is, so what does that mean? I mean, that large scale parameter or metric, number one, there are many more types done by taking the EOFs of the 250 millibar height. And there are like 12 different, if you will, weather types. Um, whereas the Europeans only found four. And so one of the issues is, well, that's very interesting. Maybe it has to do with the greater variability of the climate over North America. Um, and Melissa is working on this now, and we don't completely have a, um, an answer for this, but this is, again, kind of interesting. So we've got this one tall poppy when we use all of them. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the contribution of the other models? And we don't actually know that yet. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting, my time is racing along here, um, is a statement made in the IPCC Working Group 1, the chapter on evaluations, is that there's now high confidence that downscaling adds value, both in regions with highly variable topography and for various small scale phenomena. Now, isn't that what it's supposed to be doing? Yes. The point is that it resolves smaller scale phenomena. Ergo, it should be able to reproduce those. So in, on one level, it's trivial. But again, according to our definition of added value, that's really not sufficient. Because it's really, quite frankly, it just seems in most contexts to be expected that it's going to do better than a coarser range, coarser model when looking at high scale phenomena. But it's interesting that the IPCC actually said this. However, it's also interesting that even though we've had all these different comparison projects, particularly three different ones over Europe, none of those results contributed to any of the major messages about climate change. And what does that mean if they're saying on one side that downscaling does add value, but we're really not going to include anything from these in our estimates? And so I think there's a bit of a, a disconnect there. So another thing I think is that I don't think the community, regional modeling community and now analysts have done a very good job in really establishing what added value is. So if any of you are out there playing around with regional models, this could be a very useful thing to get involved in because um, I think it's a lot more complicated than just reducing biases. And it has to do with what happens to processes when there are errors. All right, to wait or not to wait. There was a very nice meeting uh, at NCAR, an IPCC expert meeting on evaluating MMEs. And this is what we concluded. You could use rankings to select subsets of models. But for one thing, you have to make sure, and this is a little, some things that were not done in the AR4 report, to make sure that these differences among the models are really statistically significant. Otherwise, you know, what is the point? But ultimately, the selection of the metric is crucial. You're never going to find the golden metric that can represent everything. Um, and is it really a truly meaningful one from a process point of view? And I'm actually surprised that the community has tried to use, I think, relatively superficial metrics. 
about these things without really getting into more process level work. Okay, so where are we now in terms of weighting, even though regional models add value, there's still no universal strategy for weighting the projections from different models based on their historical performance. Yes, except, for example, we have a sea ice example where there was model selection, which the IPCC uh, really trotted out. So I, I think the problem is that there's so many different regions in the world, there are so many processes that it would be very difficult to come up with just a few uh, metrics that would work everywhere, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in that. More process-oriented approaches. All right, so I've already really told you about uh, Hall and Chu, also the changes in the Arctic sea ice. Now I'm going to give you, in my rapidly disappearing time, um, what we've been trying to do in NARCAP. And again, this is work, um, some of which has been spearheaded by Melissa Bukowski. And so this is what we call establishing process level differential credibility of regional scale climate simulation. We should probably turn that into an acronym and then it will really sell in Ohio. Um, so this is determining through in-depth process level analysis of climate simulations of current or past climate, the ability of the model to reproduce those aspects of the climate system most responsible for the particular regional climate and then analyzing the model response to future forcing and determining specifically how model errors in the current simulation affect the model's response to the future forcing. And which model errors really matter? And I think we don't know that. So we're really looking for a process-based integrated expert judgment approach um, to what degree the model's response to the future forcing is deemed credible. And my example I promised Dr. Bullis in an earlier conversation, is about <coughs> process level analysis of the North American monsoon. And so here are our six regional models, and these are results for precipitation for, let's say, the monsoon season, June, July, August, September, average precipitation rate. And these are the ones driven by reanalyses. So in a sense, the best boundary conditions you're going to get. Here are observations from the University of Delaware data set. And you'll see there are commonalities and differences. Um, the models tend to overproduce precipitation in relation to the uh, topography in the lower part of Mexico. Um, to tune you in, you can't see this very clearly, but here's Arizona, here's New Mexico, there's Baja. Um, but they also tend to Many of them, not all of them, tend to under-predict precipitation um, in New Mexico and Arizona. So one thing you could do is just, you know, you take the root mean square errors of those precip biases and you come up with something and you can rank them. But is that really that useful? No, because it's really more useful to find out, at least to us, what's happening. So here is the near surface moisture flux for the six different models against the North American regional reanalysis. And um, it's really interesting. Some of the models, so what you want to see, for example, is this, this moisture flux going up the Gulf of California, up into um, Arizona. This is, the NAR actually exaggerates this a bit. It also, its moisture, its moisture is probably a little higher than in reality. Um, the models Could you get it. Yeah, this is in yeah, grams per kilogram meters per second. Okay. So it's moisture flux. And then where the arrows are, though, there's arrows some places and colors. Other right. What you have is the colors are representing the direction, okay, is the direction of the arrows, all right? The colors indicate the amount of moisture and the, the combination of the amount of moisture and the, but the length temperature. Of the don't mean anything. I think they do, but I can't remember exactly what that length is. Um, good question. So a couple of interesting things. One of the things is that the Hadley model does actually a pretty good job at least getting the direction of the flow. It's a little 
under prediction, but as I said, I think the NAR over predicted the amount of moisture. Uh, some of them do pretty poorly. They don't really go up the gulf really at all. And then some of them are kind of, the CRCM is still trying to figure out what's going on with those squigglies, actually. And this has been published in the Journal of Climate. Um, so the point was to say, well, really, how they do with moisture flux is probably much more important than how they do with just reproducing um, mean precipitation. And you can uh, read more details of this in the Journal of Climate article. Now, this is a plot also of the insect driven simulations of the scatter plot of five day averaged precipitation for the seasonal cycle. And you can see that most of the models, who is this pink one, MM5, mm, kind of weak, but most of them get the basic seasonal cycle of the south of the North American monsoon although some of them are, are clearly uh, more ragged than others. But that's NSEP. And it's interesting that, for example, in ensembles, the models were weighted based on their performance with these perfect boundary conditions. And as you'll see, that can be very different from what happens to these models when they're driven by GCMs. And I think that's the next slide. It is. Hmm. So, again, these are the observations of precipitation. And this is over, I believe, just Arizona and uh, New Mexico, that area. Um, a number of the RCMs, depending upon which model they're driven by, have now no monsoon at all. A couple of them have this gigantic monsoon that is completely misplaced seasonally. And that's an incredibly huge difference if you go back to what happens with the NSEP driving conditions. So why on earth you would want to weight models when they're driven by GCMs by how they do with perfect conditions, I can't really imagine. But that's what's been done. Come on. Come on. Um, okay, good. I'm virtually done. So here is just sort of like a simplified um, graph of the precipitation plots, the seasonal cycle. And the, the models, so here are the models that have been driven by the GFDL. And note the HAT-RM3 model, the UK Met Office model. It's both driven by the GFDL and by the HAT-CM3. So we had the same model, two different GCMs. Um, so Driven by the GFDL, it kind of goes bananas. The, it has, I guess you can say it has a monsoon, but it's shifted quite dramatically in terms of its cycle. Um, and the only model that does well is this time slice, which is the CAM, the GFDL, rather, time slice, using observed sea surface temperatures for the global model. And it's exaggerated, but at least it gets that seasonal cycle correct. So clearly, the GFEL model is doing something very bad to these models. Interestingly enough, we go down. So here we have the Hat RM3 again. And golly gee, it again, you know, different variability, but it gets the monsoon circulation, as does even the poor MM5, even though it's somewhat exaggerated. Now, what's really interesting about uh, the Hat RM3 model is it had a terrible, terrible bias in temperature in the Great Plains. I mean, sort of unbelievable, such that when we submitted this BAMS article, one reviewer came back and said, you should throw that model out. That model is garbage. It had a bias in the Great Plains of, in the summer of like five degrees. See, incredible. And yet we're in a situation where that model does better with the North American monsoon than any other model. So what, what do you say? Does it not matter for the North American monsoon that it has this horrible bias in the Great Plains? Number one, the bias actually gets smaller when it's driven by the GCMs, which is also an interesting point. So Melissa is still coming up with deeper process level explanations for this, but it's, 
it's really interesting, at least in this case, to see just how dominant the driving GCM is in terms of reproducing this stuff. I think I'm virtually finished. What do we need to make further progress? Oh, yes, many more in-depth process-oriented studies that examine the plausibility of process change under future forcing. What errors really matter and which don't? And I also like to kind of harp on what is the danger of false certainty? Especially if you're using results of climate models for adaptation planning. Um, what's the danger of only looking at a much smaller amount of the uncertainty because you've eliminated models? And these are the kinds of questions that can keep one up at night. But I suspect that the problem of false certainty could actually be much more deadly than the problem of too much uncertainty. And finally, yes, I'm from New York, not far from here. This is from the New Yorker Big Book of Global Warming Cartoons, showing sea level rise in New York. So I enjoy showing this. I have the original um, poster, and I got this one. And then I realized, I kept showing this and thinking, huh, and then I realized, oh, this is the Empire State Building. And I realized this is, you know, deep science, the kind of stuff I really like to do, that I could actually calculate what would be the sea level rise such that there would only be nine floors left of the Empire State Building. All right, so audience, how high would the sea level rise have to be? Any guesses? Roughly. The man wins a peepee dog. 320 meters, folks, which I believe, even if all of the land, ice, glaciers, and everything, Antarctica, everything melted, I don't think we could come up with 320 meters. So I'm thinking of writing to the New Yorker and saying, you know, <laughs> they're misleading people. My estimate is better because I'm averaging the Chrysler building. In the That's. <laughs> oh. All right. There you go. Well, I'm happy to go for a trip with you to each of those and stand at that, you know, before the, that floor and just look out over the vision of the flooded city. All right, that's it. Thanks. I'm happy to take any questions. And sorry it's run over, but it hasn't really.